This is important because it protects the battery from a safety perspective, but also from a longevity perspective. So a design which probably will be copied by other people at this point. Was a bit forward thinking in the fact that in the platform design, they've left a space in the vehicle for an inductive or wireless charging pad. Say hello to the Skoda ENIAC. In today's case, the Skoda ENIAC Coupe. This is actually a newer version for 2024 with 30% more acceleration, 15 kilometers more range and 4% better efficiency. Now, Skoda are upping their e-mobility game. In fact, they expect their sales to be 70% full electric by 2030. And to reach that goal, they're investing up to 5.6 billion euros over the next couple of years. Now, there are four different models to choose from. You've got your small battery variant, which we'll talk about in a second, and then three models on the larger battery pack. Now, the larger battery pack can be chosen with a single motor, which is in the rear of the vehicle, a dual motor design, and then their performance VRS version. So there's quite a lot of choices here for you to make. Now, of course, Skoda, fully owned by the Volkswagen Group, make the most of that relationship because this car is built on that Volkswagen designed MEB platform, the Modular Electric Drive Matrix. Now, this platform is probably one of the most used at the moment in the industry because this platform is shared not only with this vehicle, but also with, it's a long list, the Cupra Born, the Audi Q4 e-tron, the Volkswagen ID3, four, five, six, seven, ID Buzz, and also the Ford Explorer. So there are a lot of cars using this platform. That's a good thing, right? Because that means reliability of the platform is going to be strong given there are so many different units and models available out there. The platform rear wheel drive predominantly with an electric motor sitting on the rear axle. That gives the car a good 50-50 weight distribution. Now you think with the motor in the rear, we'd end up with a frunk, which unfortunately we do not. So if you pop the hood here, you're greeted to the air conditioning unit of all things, which is a good thing though, right? Because it means they've moved the air conditioning out of this area here where it usually sits in the vehicle or, or down here. And basically that gives us inside the car better interior cabin space. Let's talk about the electric motors in this vehicle. So there is, as I said, a single or a dual motor variant. The less powerful, so to speak, electric motor is the Volkswagen designed APP310, which is a permanent magnet brushless electric motor. To be fair, as is commonplace nowadays in the industry, the more powerful variant of this motor is the APP550, which also delivers 550 newton meters of torque. Now, this, the more powerful motor here, delivers or runs at 16,000 RPM. And they're using the gear reduction, right? It's not a gearbox, it's just a gear reducer to reduce that speed to whatever is required. Now, an interesting thing about these motors is the fact that um, they, are, they, are, they use the hairpin design which we've seen on the channel before with the Hyundai models, right? So basically this means they can get more copper wire into a certain area of the motor, which means for you more power, right? In fact, the fill ratio goes up from around 46% to 60% using this design. So it's definitely the way to go. Another interesting thing I found in an internal combustion engine, right? you have around 2,000 moving parts. That's 2,000 pieces which can and eventually will go bad. In an electric car, we have just 20 moving parts. That already starts to simplify and make the efficiency and longevity of the vehicle even better. But what VW go a step further here, and in their electric motor, which traditionally by design, has four, four ball bearings inside it, right? 
But VW go to extreme lengths that they design the electric motor to have three ball bearings, so one less than the rest of the industry. A design which probably will be copied by other people at this point. It's of course better, right? Because it means, again, less moving parts which can go wrong. So I do like that a lot. So let's talk charging, because I know this can confuse a lot of people and I know generally the, the, the charging time on the leaflet is going to tell you the fastest possible, right? But then you go home and you don't get that time whatsoever. So let me break this down as simple as possible. Before, before I do that though, two small notes. Number one, the MEB platform, which this car is sitting on, was a bit forward thinking in the fact that in the platform design, they've left a space in the vehicle for an inductive or wireless charging pad, which this car doesn't have, let's make it clear. But the design allows that in the future it can be added on. But put that aside, let's, let's stick with what we have now. So of course, charging times depend on two factors. How big your battery size is, and this car, as we said, comes with two different battery size options, and what you are plugging the car into. So if you're plugging the cars into AC, alternating current, that's what we have at home, that's what we have on most of the public network, you're going to get one charging time. If you plug into DC or rapid charging, which this car supports on the CCS European port, you're going to find these mainly on highways, although we do have some slow ones here in Malta as well, then you're going to get different charging times. So let's start with AC. So with AC on the small battery, if you charge at home, on single phase at 3.7 kilowatts um, you're going to charge this car the small battery in 18 hours move up to 7.4 kilowatts if you're using again single phase but you've got a bit more room and you can charge at that speed it's a nine hour charge or if you then go to three phase and the car does support three phase natively it's 11 kilowatts of charging and it's six hours for a full charge if we move to the bigger battery on 3.7 kilowatts, it's a 24 hour charge, so it is a big battery then, right? 7.4 goes down to 12, and the 11, fa the 11 3 phase is eight hours for a full charge of the car. What I want to point out here is that although these are the charging times, right? You will never sit and wait for your car to charge. Even on the highway, you won't do that, right? <laughs> This is something you, you plug in the car when you are not using it, which for most people is 90% of the time. If we switch to DC rapid charging, the smaller or the bigger battery, both can charge in around 30 minutes, which is ideal on a highway situation. So let's talk battery pack. So as I said, there are two battery size options for this vehicle. The smaller battery is a 58 kilowatt hour usable battery pack, which let me tell you for a small city or a small country like Malta, that is plenty. However, if you want the bigger battery variant, that is also available. That is a usable 77 kilowatt hour battery pack. We'll get into how much range each of them give in a second. Now those batteries, the larger one is made, actually made up of 288 individual battery cells running on 400 volt architecture. Now, the cells themselves come from third party suppliers and VW Group work with a number of third party suppliers. In fact, they have Samsung, they have LG Chem and they have CATL all supplying them with battery cells to go into their vehicles. Now, the VW Group then takes those cells and assembles the battery pack. That is being done at the main Volkswagen plant, but also, and this is very interesting, the only other factory in the VW Group in Europe which is manufacturing the battery packs or assembling the battery packs is the Skoda factory. So that's, I guess, a big stamp of approval for the quality coming out of the Skoda factory, which assembles the battery pack not only for their cars, but also for others in the VW lineup. So that's a very interesting thing. VW Group are also on a trajectory for something to make their own battery cells in something they call a unified cell design, where they intend to use one battery shell casing and fill it with different chemistries depending on the application for the vehicles. For example, for their performance vehicles, they will go for NCM chemistry as they do for their Porsche models. For cars which need more uh, longevity, they will go for LFP design. And interestingly enough, they believe the same shell is also going to be used for the next big thing in batteries, right? Which is solid 
state. Everybody at the moment is investing billions into solid state. It is the next big thing in battery. Sometimes you see a post on social media that some brand has batteries which charge twice as fast, half the price, double the capacity. Well, they're talking about solid state. Everybody is looking into solid state. Nobody has yet brought it into a production ready vehicle, but it is definitely the next big thing when it comes to batteries. What are the advantages of solid state? Well, it means faster charging times, cheaper batteries, batteries which last longer. This is a big thing and they believe their unified cell design will go through all their vehicles and they'll fill it with whatever they deem um, necessary. What's different about the little side note here about solid state, right? In a solid state battery, we actually remove the liquid electrolyte. That is the liquid solution in a battery where the, the lithium ions, right? They flow from one side to the other of the battery as it is being either charged or discharged. And in a solid state battery, they change that liquid electrolyte for a solid, right? And that thus gives you a number of advantages. So let's talk battery cooling. This is another very important concept, particularly in this, I like to call them second generation of electric vehicles. So if we roll back time and look at the electric vehicles, which came out 12 years ago, right? The first ones on the road, were generally very small cars. They did not have any battery cooling, which means the battery pack was susceptible to getting hot and then cold, which, have died, which did affect their degradation or how long those battery packs last. In fact, if you look at the battery packs being released on electric cars 12 years ago, you'll notice their warranty periods were actually very short because they knew this was going to happen. If you notice the warranties on the electric cars being sold today, they've extended them. And one of the major reasons they've been able to do that is because of battery cooling. So what is this? This is a cooling plate found under the battery pack, which is going to regulate the temperature of the battery pack, trying to keep it at the ideal battery temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. This is important because it protects the battery from a safety perspective, but also from a longevity perspective. So while liquid cooling at the module level has become the norm in the industry, the VW Group were actually the first to market with such a technology some five years ago and the sort of the rest of it has copied them so to speak in this approach tesla still use a different approach here where they cool the battery cells themselves directly which is a bit dicey right it's 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 liquid cooling straight between the cells themselves rather than the modules and um, but these are two different approaches being taken in the industry so let's talk regen or regenerative braking right that's the vehicle's ability to recharge the battery as you are driving and electric vehicles are very good at this right they can recover up to 20 percent of the energy you essentially use is then recovered just to give an example of this i really i recently did a trip with my car and i left from one place with 30 kilometers of range showing on the dashboard and i arrived at my destination with 42 kilometers of range so of course there was a downhill trip right but just goes to show how you can recharge the battery as you are driving now this car has a b mode regeneration option um, engaged from down here or you have your regen pedals behind the steering wheel now a bit more on the feel of the region i'll discuss more in my driving video which goes live after this one right so make sure you're subscribed with that notification bell so you're notified the second that goes out so let's talk WLTP or the real world driving range you can expect from this car. So two battery options, of course it varies between them. Smaller battery gives you a plentiful 408 kilometers. That is good enough range for two whole weeks of commute for the average driver here in Morden, which means you need to plug in to charge this car just once every two weeks. Bigger battery gives you 573 kilometers. So in that case, you need to charge it even less frequently, right? Now these are WLTP numbers. Now, if you're from a colder country or you've seen other reviews of this car from other countries like the UK, for example, where they have colder temperature and higher speeds, those ranges will not be true. But here in Malta, with our ideal climate, close to that ideal battery temperature of 25 degrees Celsius, and the fact that we have low speeds means that we come close to achieve and sometimes even exceed the WLTP rating. So what is the railroad range though here in Malta? Well, that's what I'm going to check 
in my driving video because I will be driving the car for some time. We will check what real world efficiency I'm getting and we'll backtrack what the actual number is here in Malta. So make sure you're tuning in for the driving video. So while this car doesn't do vehicle to load, it is prepared for V2G or vehicle to grid. In fact, the VW Group are currently running a pilot project in Sweden, started in December of 2023, where they have a fleet of cars and their battery packs essentially are being used. They're being plugged into different points on the grid, right near people's homes most of the time. They plug in using the DC um, rapid charging connector. And instead of taking power from the grid, they're being used to feed power into the grid, therefore, therefore stabilizing the energy in that area. This is a perfect solution. Last summer, we had some major power cuts here in Malta, right? And it wasn't, or at least we've been told, it wasn't the power station which wasn't giving off, out enough power, but it was the distribution network which was failing, which means the sub-branches within the communities for the most part were fine. Well, if we have vehicle to grid, that gets eliminated because the power then comes from the cars rather than the power station, right? How does this work in principle? Well, it means that you as the consumer can essentially get paid for giving power to the grid when the grid needs it. And you take the power back when the grid has an overload of power, right? So this is something definitely we're going to see going forward. It's still a bit far off, not from a technology point of view, but from a political point of view, let's say that, and from an infrastructure point of view. So this is something to look at into the future. But the cars, the cars are ready. Now, of course, the Skoda Enyaq Coupe was my first vehicle I'm reviewing on this VW MEB platform. But I promise you, it's not going to be the last. There's a number of details which I've left out today just to leave a bit more talking points for the upcoming video. So make sure you are tuning in for those. But as always, I'd like to thank you, the viewer, Maverick for the technical, Continental Cars, who are now representing Skoda in Malta. If you want to help out the channel, of course, the merch is available from the description below. You can join as a YouTube member as well, and the least you can do is hit that like button and share this video with someone who should watch it. But as always, I hope me and the Skoda Enyaq Coupe have convinced you that the future is electric.